Well, hello, and welcome back for another edition of the AI Insiders Podcast, the flagship podcast of AI apocalyptimists everywhere. Are you an apocalyptimist? Well, do you think AI might lead to a brilliant future, but could also go horribly wrong? You then are an apocalyptimist. Sign of the times. Hi, I'm Adam Russell, the director of the AI division at University of Southern California's Information Sciences Institute, and your host for the AI Insiders, where I get the privileged chance to talk to the pretty unique humans we have here at ISI, who could be doing anything and instead are working on, with, and around AI at ISI. And I call it a privilege because like many people, I'm both excited and a little concerned about what kind of world we're ushering in with these increasingly capable machines and models. And so I believe I have a chance to test my pretty basic hypothesis that how our increasingly AI imbued future turns out will in fact depend as much on how we humans decide to shape it or not. And so understanding AI means also understanding the humans behind AI. And when you talk to them, when you look beyond the big names dominating the press and you bother to scratch beneath the surface, I think you find people who come to the world's fight from very different perspectives and experiences. That tells us both a lot about the complexities we're facing today, but also gives us, I think, reason to hope that we're really in this together. And these folks know that. And one person I'm really glad to be in this with is my guest today, Cassandra Rushti. I hope I said that right, a research assistant and a PhD candidate at USC and ISI. Now, like me, Cassandra comes to AI in a way that's not at all what one might predict. We will explore that a little bit today. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to talking with her, and especially getting into her, her origin story. Cassandra, welcome to AI Insiders. Thank you, Adam. I'm glad to be here. Well, and as I promised, let's not waste any time. Let's get into your origin story. So the first question I like to do in this space is take you back in time and introduce you to your 10, maybe even 12-year-old self, and watch you explain to that 10 or 12-year-old self, what the heck are you doing with AI and here in this world, et cetera? I love that you t switched it to 12 for me because little <laughs> do you know, at 12 is when I moved from Romania to the US. Perfect timing. And how would I describe it is we're asking questions about how do we detect unfairness and how do we address it? I've always cared a lot about unfairness, whether it was in school, on the playground, at home with a brother. Yeah. I think that I always had a very strong reaction when something felt unfair to me. Um, and I think that's ultimately what brought me to it now within such an encoded world that we live in. Where are we encoding unfairness around us? Well, that, so that's interesting that you emphasize the coding part. Um, but to date, do you think AI has done more for fairness or more for unfairness? I would say more for unfairness, but I don't think it is... It's fault. So, you know, a little anthropomorphizing it here. Right. AI is really a tool that we are building and we are very imperfect. So I think the world is very unfair in very many ways. AI is making generalizations. So it's creating a lot of systems and automatic rules where it doesn't see the full context and nuance. Mm -hmm. So I think in general, the topic of fairness is very important in AI because it will generalize in unfair ways. And we need to think about how do we interact with it in a way that we find reasonable. Yeah, no, that, that's fair. Um, who's kind of your hero when it comes to tackling unfairness? I might point to somebody that I'm actually, I've had the pleasure of taking a few courses with, and I'm currently doing an AI policy clinic with mm. Merve Hickok. She's also comes from an HR background, similar to myself, and got interested and captivated by the AI policy world. So she's part of the Center for AI and Digital Policy clinic that puts out the AI and democratic values report, um, CAIDP. Strongly recommend people to look it up. It's a great resource for what's happening in the world of AI policy. Here, here. Um, and I think just genuinely a good human that is looking for how can we make a difference and how do we do that collectively? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to, you, you mentioned HR uh, is one way you can buy. So we'll explore that because that doesn't stand out. Usually you hear people talking about this as like, you know, well, I've coded since I was six years old and I, you know, uh, 
I knew it was math or math or death for me. Um, <laughs> tell me, tell me how you got in HR and how that led you to AI. Yeah. Uh, funny enough, it was an element of math or death. <laughs> okay, I do, well. My background academically is math, but it was always math and something else. Math on its face is a bit too philosophical for my taste. And as much as I love the philosophy aspect of it, it's always, and now how does this play in our day-to-day -day world? So I almost went towards the math of finance. I ended up going away from the math of finance, which felt unethical to me in many ways. And mm -hmm. that led me to management consulting. Management consulting to me meant executive compensation. And it was something that was nuanced. And I think measuring finance in a measuring fairness in a very similar way is very nuanced. What we're looking to do is judge if something is right or wrong, but there isn't an answer that's that simple. So I think coming from the HR perspective, I learned that oftentimes there isn't black and white. Gathering context is important. Yeah. yeah. You have to be smart in what questions you ask to gather that context, but there are principles that you can generalize and those are important. And finding those things that you can generalize and understand when to fine tune them, when to calibrate them, all of those measures and foundational principles can be very helpful. But what you're trying to do is see the bigger picture. So you said the, the word nuance, which I think is right. Can you computationally encode nuance? Do you think that the nuances that you were dealing with in that position of having to balance and weigh both general ethical principles, but also the particulars of this context, I mean, do you have any hope that we can we can encode that in a way that could be computed by a machine? I think what we could encode is a threshold for when the nuance requires human judgment. Nice. So I think it's a component where the algorithm can say, I have all of these facts. I th have enough to recommend this. But these are the areas where it's different enough from what I've seen before that a human brain should take a look at this and confirm that there isn't enough of a precedent or something different in this context that requires different conclusions. Interesting. Yeah. No, I think the, the idea to building a, a machine that sort of knows when it doesn't know or knows that there's something yeah. else, somebody else who knows better. The best humans certainly do that, right? <laughs> right? Exactly. Uh, and to me, the, the feedback loop there is, you know, we make an ethical decision, changes the world a little bit, and now we have to bring more people to the table to sort of have a conversation about that. In, in your experience, um, is there an organization or, or a group that does that feedback really well? Kind of what comes to mind, again, an organization within the technology space that I, I would love to highlight. It's called For Humanity. It's a nonprofit, uh, very diverse in its membership globally and in terms of industries and backgrounds. And what they're aiming to do is a audit for algorithms. Hmm. So similar to how Sarbanes-Oxley, after a disaster, implemented some serious audit rules for accounting, mm -hmm. implementing something hopefully before some big disaster. Wouldn't, where that, be, wouldn't that be a nice surprise? Yeah. Uh, and also on that note, tying together another background question with HR, compensation has a similar disaster that led to Dodd-Frank regulation. And that Dodd-Frank regulation is a lot more focused towards disclosure rather than hard accounting thresholds of what's acceptable and not acceptable. Yeah. And I think fairness could work in a similar way where there's required disclosure, annual disclosure, consultants that are trained in the nuance of measuring fairness of different systems within different applications. And it just creates this whole secondary market of mm -hmm. analyzing mm -hmm. and comparing companies that are truly ethically rigorous uh, versus the window dressing out there.
what not looking at your disciplines not looking at what your skill sets are what instead would you say is kind of your i call it a secret slash superpower that you bring to a team because everybody brings kind of a different power to the team what's what what would you say is your superpower and it's not bragging because i'm forcing you to say it sure <laughs> all right let's see bragging mode um two come to mind one is attention to detail and a very deep organization skill set. I like to keep things clear and simple, constantly making sure that everybody is on the same page, uh, making I'm, sure everything, you know, I know where the printers and the restrooms are. It's kind of like making sure that I know the environment enough so that whatever needs to unfold, whatever work and conversations can just uh, take place naturally. Okay. Um, so we Wherever you got that power from, I need to figure out how to get it. If it's a radioactive spider, uh, give yeah. me my address. Please send it to me so it can bite me and I can have that power because I'm envious. What's your second one? Yeah. The second one is not being afraid to do things I don't know how to do. Um, and I would say that is that is something everybody should do more of. It's easy to stay away from something because you don't know enough. But being in that uncomfortable space where you're just trying and asking questions and doing until something interesting comes out uh, is important work. So how do you think you got that power? Honestly, being an immigrant is probably a big part of it. I, you know, at 12 had to help my family set up a household. So calling the electricity company and figuring out how do we get electricity is something, well, I certainly don't know how to do that, but I can speak and ask questions until we identify what we do to get power. I'm, I'm loving this origin story. Yeah. You didn't really have a choice, right? It was either that or sit in the dark. So exactly. I think and, and there, I know people who would rather sit in the dark and I'm with you. Like, <laughs> let's, let's, let's get them that power somehow. Really? Yeah. Really, really interesting. Given where you are, do you have any advice to younger people who might be interested in getting into this area? I realize that's poorly formulated, what do you mean, AI, unfairness, whatever, but go with it, this area. But what advice would you offer someone? I'd say the biggest piece of advice is seek mentorship. Expand your network. Don't be afraid to speak to people that you don't know, but admire in some way. Similar to what I had mentioned in superpowers is don't be afraid to do things you don't know how to do. Yeah. Uh, so, so much easier to say than, than to do. Do you have any tips for introverts? How to get, out, um, how to get started? Think about the worst case scenario, mm -hmm. accept that, embrace it and shoot for anything above that. It'll be better than that. Yeah. I like that uh, with 99% chance. That's fantastic. Uh, let's go with a hypothetical and it is purely hypothetical and say that uh, an AI system has uh, suddenly developed sentience, but doesn't really seem to understand humans. You can give this AI a book, a movie, poem, something, some artifact that you think, hey, you know, look at this or consume it or listen or whatever, and it might give you a better sense of kind of the creatures, creatures you're dealing with here as humans. Maybe some sort of history book, honestly. There's a lot to learn to not repeat history. And I'm one that I can sound very naive if I try to talk about history because I don't know the concrete facts, but where my memory does work and kick in is the lessons. What do we learn from this betrayal or this um, interaction between a smaller country with a smaller army that takes over a larger country that's just not well organized. So it's it's all in the, in the lessons, and I think a history book would be what I would give the AI. Yeah, that, that's fair. Understanding who we are, uh, boy, and history won't pull punches, right? It'll it'll reveal the the amazing things we've done, and oh boy, the things that have gone. It does depend on who's writing that history. So um, still bias in there too. Mm, the winners usually tend to write the history. Great history book, uh, Lies My Teacher Told Me, uh, if you haven't seen it, it's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> if you, uh, given that we're at this time of deep technical inflection and craziness, you could have anybody from history, live or dead, we, we're in history now, uh, over for dinner and quiz them about wisdom or suggestions they would ha have for how, how we navigate this crazy time. Who'd that person be? What's wisdom do you think we, we need? And it's okay if it's, you know, 
if it's grandma. Ooh. I mean, if I'm getting the superpower of having an, an interview with anybody alive or dead, it would definitely be my grandma. Um, okay. She unfortunately passed before I was born and I was born on her birthday and I'm told I'm very much like her. So I'd be curious to interview somebody who I think is very similar to me, but grew up in very different circumstances. I think it would be fascinating to ask her about her notions of fairness. Okay, so here comes the hardest question of all so far. I, I'm on the hunt for a good AI joke. Cassandra Rushdie, do you have for me a good AI joke? Uh, I'm going to try. We'll it, see if it, it gets it. any laughs or if it's just a little too philosophical. Um, oh, it's a two-parter. Right. Um, so first, why don't AI systems have existential crises? It's because they can't think outside of the box. They're trapped in a loop of ifs and thens. And then part two, but if they did have an existential crisis, what would it say? Oh, man. Okay. I think, therefore, I ram. But when I'm low on memory, do I even exist? Or am I just a figment of my cash? I I think, therefore, I ram. Tell you what, like you have reinstilled in me some optimism that there are good jokes out there. Okay. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. That alone. <laughs> Uh, would you rather see AI surpass humans in creativity or empathy? I think empathy. And in general, when you think about humans overall, I think it uh, would be pretty easy to surpass humans in empathy. I think we're empathetic in theory and less so much in actions. So that's a, yeah, I think that's, I think that's true. Um, who is likely to become a AI incarnation first beyonce or taylor swift hmm. taylor swift she, yeah, she'll uh, be uploaded yeah 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 she's constantly reinventing so i'd love to yeah. see that i mean she'll just come back as a gpt it makes sense yeah. to me <laughs> well um last totally unfair question what do you see yourself doing in five years um what i hope to be doing is continuing the type of research that I'm focusing on now, asking questions about fairness, and ideally really leaning into mentorship. Ideally in five years, I'll be somewhere in a classroom teaching some basics of technology ethics in some form or fashion and motivating kids to pursue it, their life dream. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's a great target. And again, at ISI, part of the reason I really appreciate the culture here is we, we've we committed ourselves explicitly to building leaders. You, you've come along and in many cases, uh, nonlinear and strange ways to, to ISI certainly, but also this, you know, like I said, the world's fight uh, in terms of making sure AI turns out okay for us. Absolutely. So, I, I want to thank you for coming on. Uh, I don't, you don't seem terribly scared, so I don't know if you've overcome fear there, but uh, I think telling a, a good AI joke is terrifying. So bravo to you. Uh, for doing that. And uh, I hope that your call for more perspective, diversity, and input in this space uh, will is increasingly being heard. So thank you for that, Cassandra. Absolutely. I'm glad to be here. And even if I don't look terribly scared, uh, I also hate public speaking. Uh, I just force myself to do it anytime the chance comes up. And I appreciate it. And I appreciate you trusting me. And uh, especially our our editor, Nina, will make both of us sound like we're just naturals at this. Stellar. All right. Well, if you enjoy these short podcasts, please do the thing. Follow your heart. Give us stars. Subscribe. Spread the word. Send us feedback. Offer up hard questions, I guess is what I was asking Cassandra in many cases. Certainly crazy questions. Send us jokes if you have any. Uh, we're open to that. And then, of course, just keep listening and learning. And please join us again for another episode of AI Insiders. We will continue to navigate our way through this weird, 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 weird world trying to do what humans do best when they face these kinds of challenges, working together as if all our lives depend on each other, because they do. So for now, for the future, fight on. <laughs>